the next. Thank you very much, Elif, and uh, thank you to all the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure and a big honor to be here at the opening event of the Quest. I wish you good luck and uh, really uh, great fun with the research that you're going to do. I'm going to talk about the preparation of, of uh, states using dissipation. In fact, I'm going to talk not so much about hybrid systems, but we can easily imagine hybrid systems where you use the property of one system to affect another one. And if you want to put my uh, present talk into that context, you might actually enhance the performance of a wonderful qubit with wonderful lifetime properties by coupling it to a strongly dissipative system and using the dissipation of that system to steer quantum and coherent properties of your otherwise perfect qubit. Of course, a perfect qubit with only one imperfection, namely that it's hard to address it, it's hard to get in contact with it, and maybe your agent to get in contact with it is exactly that dissipative system. But uh, let, me, let me start out uh, uh, slowly. In the classical world, we're actually very fortunate that we have uh, dissipation. Otherwise, you wouldn't like to be in the situation of that guy or that guy or arriving towards an airport uh, because you would have to fly by since you would not be able to go down and, 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 and stop the plane. Um, in the, in the uh, quantum world, we also uh, benefit from friction, damping, and loss mechanisms uh, in a very simple way. Uh, when we want to engineer a quantum state, very, very often, we refer to maybe some initial state and some target final state, and we talk about the perfect unitary evolution that takes us from here to there. But before you even start that perfect unitary evolution, you have to start here. And the initial state for many experiments is also a pure state if that's what you want. And the way we prepare our initial state of atoms, for example, is for wait for these atoms to fall into their ground state by dissipation. So, so any interesting state over here, entangled, topological, squeeze state, any interesting dynamics, a gate process or sensing or clock, actually it often has to start somewhere where you actually started in a kind of ground state or a kind of, of, of steady state of your system that the system has actually arrived at because of dissipation. So maybe you have cryogenically cooled your cupids in your superconducting device. Maybe you have optically pumped your atoms. Maybe you have used buffer gas or laser cooling to cool your atoms into the cold state, which is the starting point then for, for something that happens here. Okay. So, so, um, but that's something that happens here does not even have to be unitary to achieve these goals. And so my presentation will be about decaying into that final state or using measurements and feedback, which is also engaging dissipation to go from initial to final state. Error correction mechanisms in quantum computing is actually also about having dissipation, doing measurement on your system, correcting those errors, and then getting into the state you want to go. And finally, I'll also talk a little bit about xenodynamics, which is also a mechanism that, that affects the, uh, the, the evolution of a system, takes you towards interesting states, uh, but uh, benefiting from the effects of, of dissipation. So in, in dissipation, uh, in, in quantum mechanics, we are talking typically about a system that's coupled to its environment. It could be an atom that emits light, so it's radiative emission, decay of excited states. It could be atoms or molecules that collide with a background gas or molecules that are moving in a solvent, excitons that are coupled to phonons and photons, light modes that get absorbed by the mirrors. So there's just a number of physical systems. In fact, all physical systems we deal with have some sort of relaxation mechanisms, and you can typically name it from your own expert field. Um, and we use those mechanisms to prepare the initial state of, of our quantum system for many purposes. It's also intimately connected with the act of measurements. So in fact, the way you do measurements on a quantum system is by coupling it to your meter. And your meter is another quantum system, and there's a quantum dynamical evolution going on. And, and uh, it's not only at the level of, of words in the experiment, it's also from the point of view of a theorist. As a theorist, I'm describing dissipation by a master equation. The terms in that master equation are actually often representing outcomes of different types of measurement. If I don't do the measurement, I have to average all these possible measurements. Then I get my incoherent master equation. Alternatively, I can do trajectory approaches where I simulate the outcome of measurements, or I actually do measurements, and then I have the conditioned dynamics of the system conditioned on those, uh, those outcomes. And in fact, it, it allows me to give a formal description of dissipation, which is at the same time related to measurements that I do or that I could do on my quantum system. So all these things that we know as damping rates that go into master equations, the quantum jump behavior, the heralding of states due to measurements is really showing how intimately dissipation is connected to, to uh, the act of measurement in quantum physics. 
And this will also be, 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 be clear in my presentation. I'm not going to show a lot of equations and formalism in this talk. I'm going to talk about physical systems, but it's in the back of our head that when we have dissipation, I mean, this goes in as damping rates in, in your physical system. So, so what I will talk about, well, I will try to talk about it, or give a few examples of how the damping or the decay or the decoherence or the loss helps us create really interesting quantum states really interesting pure quantum states in, in this particular talk, uh, for example, entangled states of several particles. Uh, I'll first talk about entangling systems that never met using measurements. This is a fairly old story, and, and, and I do not have much to add to the story, but I'd like to, to warm up using that example. And then I will uh, spend more time on different forms of dissipative entanglement where we are not looking. That is, we are not performing measurements on the system. We just let them relax, and then we engineer the world around these particles in such a way that when they decay, they decay into wonderful, coherent entangled states. Okay? So, in fact, dissipation is not as coherent as it seems. And there will be a dark state mechanism that I want to advertise. There will be a Zeno dynamic mechanism that I want to advertise. And recently, we did some work with Durga, who was formerly actually here in Tel Aviv, uh, on something we call quantum Zeno training, where we also make a quantum system find really fascinating states uh, based on dissipation on the system. So let, let's get going. Uh, here's a, a, a classic paper 18 years ago uh, from the group of, of Ignacio Sirac and Peter Soller, uh, where you imagine two atoms sitting really far apart, being prepared individually in a superposition of the ground and the excited state. Okay. And these atoms can now be sitting here um, and, and potentially emit a photon. One can emit a photon, the other one can also emit a photon. If these photons are guided through fiber systems to a semi-reflective mirror here, then this detector can get a click, but you don't really know if the photon came from the left or the right. So in some sense, you can see that the state who can have given you that photon would be a certain superposition of those two states, namely where the atom was excited here or it was excited there. And if I act on the state where both are excited initially, then I have to remove a quantum excitation, but I don't know if I should remove it here or here. So I prepare actually the state ground excited plus excited ground as if the photon came from the first atom or the second atom. Okay. If I see the photon in the other detector, there's a similar relation, but if this is a plus sign for that detector, it will actually be the state with a minus sign for the other detector. On average, you don't create coherence between atoms by letting them decay. But if you see the photon in this magic way, then you actually do create an entangled state between those two atoms. And this is used in experiments. So Chris Monroe in Maryland is taking atoms in two different ion traps, and he's collecting photons emitted by these ions, and then he's actually entangling them, even though they are meters apart. And there's been experiments with NV centers of the same style. There's been entanglement between an atom and a quantum dot by Michael Kuhl. Also exactly the same principle. It's very smart. It's very smart because you don't have to bring these systems into physical contact. So in particular for hybrid systems, it's interesting that you can take the kind of objective, the kind of housing environment for one system, and the other kind for another environment. As long as you can collect the light from those two, and those photons have the same frequency, and are photons of the same kind then you cannot tell where it comes from, and therefore you will make this kind of entanglement. Very smart scheme. Sorry I didn't invent it. So here's a, a, a version of the same idea. It's a little bit different, though. This is a big atomic gas, and this is another big atomic gas, on the order of, of 10 to the 12 atoms in each of those two clouds. And then you send a laser field through, and the laser field is going to experience a phase shift, or in fact, in the real experiment, it was a polarization rotation sensitive to the atomic occupation of different internal states. So in, if you measure that phase shift, you will have counted how many atoms are in one versus another state in this cloud. But instead of counting it after passage of one cloud, you let it pass through two clouds. And then after that, you do this phase or polarization measurement. So this is a homodyne type detection, which is done over here. And what it tells you is the sum of an observable from one cloud and the other cloud. And the bag action of doing such a measurement actually prepares an entangled state of those two clouds. Because you don't know if you measured population difference to be zero, whether it meant that it was zero in this cloud and in that cloud, or it was a big number here and a big negative number in the other one. And that quantum mechanical uncertainty is exactly what entanglement is about. So, so in the experiments by Eugene Polsig in Copenhagen, they were making this sort of entanglement by measurement. And it came as a big surprise, actually, because people thought that such experiments would need quantum resources. But this is a classical field. Classical field is not as classical as you would think, and Gerd Leuchs has also made beautiful experiments with coherent states, demonstrating that, yes, it's a coherent state, but as soon as you pass through the first cloud, you actually entangle it with the state of these atoms. 
and then you entangle it with the next cloud here, and when you finally measure on the light, you have actually achieved this atom atom entanglement in this experiment. So we can we can do this kind of experiments by measurements. But here's a simple analysis. We did just take it out, not because it's an important paper, but just because I like the analysis. We put two qubits in a cavity, and we put a coherent driving field through the cavity. Of course, these atoms interacting with the field, they will also affect the phase of the transmitted signal. So when I measure the transmitter signal and the intensity of the transmitter signal, it will tell me about the state of these uh, two atoms or these two qubits. And, and uh, what you see down here is such two random currents. And even though the currents look almost indistinguishable, there's a blue and a black one here in the plot, if I look at what is the state of the qubits conditioned on the measurement record, that's a quantity I can calculate because I know what is the measurement back action of every single measurement along this uh, time axis here, then what I get is a population of the minus entangled state. So this is the Bell state, uh, EG minus GE. And you can see in one case, it actually comes up to one. So that's the blue signal trace. So in this case, the atoms have actually collapsed into that entangled state. And in the blue black trace, I go back to zero population of that state. So in that case, I'm not in that particular entangled state. The difference between the two signals, if you integrate them, is actually that the blue signal integrates to zero, and the black signal is systematically a little bit lower and integrates to negative values. Um, I want to show you one thing here. This signal integrating to, six, to zero is natural because this EG minus GE state is not coupled to the field at all. This is equivalent to a spin singlet state, and a spin singlet state of two spins is invariant under rotation. So when this guy interacts with the light field, it stays exactly the same. So it's exactly the same as having vacuum inside your cavity. So this is why there's no phase shift. While these atoms, they are really interacting. You can absorb the photons from the cavity, go into that state and into that state. So their interaction with the field is what causes a, pick, a, a, a measurable, measurable effect on the, on the transmitted signal. So, so the theme here is that, that you can sometimes get one result, sometimes another result, when you are heralding upon your measurements. And sometimes you can also see that, that a state like this one is actually a nice and stable entangled state, and you keep monitoring over time. So even if something should go wrong in your experiment, you, you would, might go back again to this zero signal, and you have performed a quality control. The state is the, the state you pref, uh, expect it to be. So uh, here is, a, and uh, of course, with cavities, you can, you can not only do measurements. You could also think about just using the interaction naturally occurring in a cavity. So this is a picture we see very often. If you have an atom in a cavity, there's a damping of the atom. There's a damping of the cavity. But there's also a coherent coupling where the atom exchanges excitation with the cavity field. If this is happening with a frequency G, and G is larger than both of the two decay rates, we have what we call uh, high cooperativity in the system. Ideally, there would be no damping, and then you would have perfect Warby oscillations of this system sitting here. And, and of course, if I have now, instead of one atom, I have two atoms, you can imagine that I could entangle such two atoms just by coherently, unitarily driving an excitation from one atom into a photon and then reabsorb it by the second atom. And that's true, and that has actually been optimized, and it turns out that the best fidelity you can get for such an entangled state goes as 1 minus 1 divided by the square root of this cooperativity. So if this is a big number, you get high fidelity. You have to sort of balance. It's a little bit dangerous to be in the atom because the atom decays. It's also a little bit dangerous to be in the cavity with the excitation because the cavity decays. So how are you going to trade uh, the optimal process? And that actually gives this, this funny uh, expression here. Now, uh, you can actually trade success probability for fidelity. What if you don't insist this to happen every time and you combine the interactions in this system with also measurements? So we started that with, with my student, Anna Sørensen, some years ago. So we just pretend that we're actually sitting out here looking at the signal at the same time. Of course, this signal will tell you, inform you about the state on top of uh, what you can calculate from the internal dynamics in this resonator. So when we, we did that calculation, it actually turned out that we can get a fidelity that goes as 1 minus 1 over C. So you see, if cooperativity is 100, this is a 10% infidelity, which is now only a 1% infidelity. It doesn't work every time, so that's why I said we trade success probability for fidelity. But it can still work an appreciable fraction of the time. So, so this is a way, if you really want high fidelity, to let this photon actually leak. Try not to avoid it, but just if you can measure that, then you actually have a window into the dynamics and you have an, an, an improved performance of this particular system. And Anas, who is a super smart guy at the, now at the Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, he has actually developed 
numerous proposals where he's going in and, and using this combination of measurements together with unitary dynamics, finding what is the optimum trade-off between looking and just letting the system evolve. And, and of course, you have to choose yourself if you want it to work every time, or you can accept it only works a quarter of the time, but at a higher fidelity as, as, the, uh, as the reward. So, so in, in this particular uh, example, light was the environment, and the atoms was the system. And the atom-light interaction seen from the atomic point of view is dissipation, because you're leaking into the light field. But the fact that I measure the light, in some sense, repurifies the system state. I mean, the atomic state dissipates into the light field, but if you measure the light field, then it's, you bring back coherence into the system again. There's nothing lost if you can measure all the light. So that, that is maybe an important message for this kind of schemes. But it also comes with, of course, a caveat, and that is you have to measure the light to actually get this effect. So the question is, can we also make interesting quantum states using dissipation, as I've done so far, but without doing the measurement? Sometimes the detector is probably the harder, it's harder to make a good detector than making a good mirror, for example. So, so it's not a super good idea to replace your good mirror with a detector. So can we do without the detector? Okay, and the answer is, of course, yes, because otherwise I would not have it a slide on my talk. So, so, and just to remind you, uh, here's a, uh, just two very, very simple examples where dissipation gives you non-trivial, interesting coherent states. Okay, so I already um, advertised that dissipation is good to make the, the ground state, but the ground state is typically not a very exciting state. Now I'll give you one or two exciting states, uh, which are also very simple. Here's a, 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 a three-level atom. So it has a ground state, an optically excited state, and a higher lying state. Let's assume that this state has a short lifetime, but this one up here has a long lifetime. So it could be a metastable state, it could be a Rydberg state, for example, with a long lifetime. Or here I have a Raman transition, so I have two stable low lying states and an intermediate optically excited state with a short lifetime. Now, what happens if I drive this atom or this atom with strong laser drive on those two optical transitions? Is that you will actually move into so called dark state. This state who has amplitude omega 2 multiplying state 1 and omega 1 multiplying state 3 will have destructive interference in the absorption process towards the middle state. You can see here that the driving from state 1 towards state 2 goes with the amplitude omega 1. So I get omega 1 times omega 2. But if I go from 3 to 2, it comes with omega 2 times minus omega 1, and they cancel. So there's destructive interference in the absorption of those two laser beams. So that means that this state is actually an eigenstate, and it's a coherent superposition state. And the reason that the atom goes into that is actually the dissipation of state 2. You can start anywhere at time 0, turn on the lasers, and then the system will go into this state as a steady state. Okay? And that's the dissipation who makes that happen. And it's a very interesting exercise to see how it actually works. How can dissipation make it work? But if you didn't have dissipation of the middle state, of course you would just be oscillating between these three states forever. But because of dissipation, you end up in these states. Okay, and they are called dark because when you see them in the lab, you start seeing some fluorescence from this state, but then it, the fluorescence stops, and then you have complete darkness because you only populate long-lived states, so there's no fluorescence anymore. Now, what we want to do in, in, in the next slides is actually to generalize this philosophy, but to larger system or to more particles, to see if we can find a way to engineer quantum states who, like this one, do not absorb radiation, and therefore they don't undergo this particular dissipation. So in, at the end of the day, of course, you don't want a system who is emitting photons into your face all the time. You want to use the decay mechanism to push the system somewhere else. And that somewhere else should be an interesting superposition state or eventually an entangled state. So, so how much can we actually do without measurements? And it turns out we can do pretty much everything if we can engineer the right form of dissipation. And uh, there's been a number of papers. So here's a paper by the Peter Soder group, Quantum States and Phases in Driven Quantum Systems with Cold Atoms. So this is really a, a paper in which they look at how the master equation with damping can drive a many-body system into super exciting uh, uh, many body states. Uh, here's another paper by Ignacio Sirac and, and, and his collaborators, quantum computation, quantum state engineering driven by dissipation. In both of these papers, there's no interesting Hamiltonian, but there's interesting damping, <laughs> okay? And they engineer an interesting damping who has the effect that their many body systems are going into super exciting states. And it doesn't take a lot of resources. So here's actually a, a picture from, from this article by, by Ignacio Sirac, where you have a particle here, a particle here, a particle here, and a particle here. So there's a chain of particles. And 
they have to have this particular property that two particles, they share together a common bath. So when I'm sitting here and I see a click in my detector, I don't know if it came from here or from there. So that's a little bit like the two atoms I showed you in the beginning. So this click will actually entangle those two. So the dissipative event of losing energy into this reservoir can, has formally the property of entangling that pair. And then there's another reservoir, that means there's another damping which acts collectively on those other two, and two, and two, and two. So on paper for the theorist, you need to have a master equation where your damping terms at most involve a collective damping of pairs of particles. Nearest neighbor in a 1D chain. And if you can do that, according to this paper, you can do universal quantum computing. There's no gates here, there's no one-bit gates, there's no two-bit gates. The only thing that's present in this scheme is dissipation. The steady state of that particular algorithm they develop is going to be the answer of your computation. Okay? And you will go there with certainty no matter where you start. You just have to wait until the system has relaxed under this funny Hamiltonian. And the same up here, where with Hans-Peter Büchler and Peter Soller, they are suggesting interesting phases of many-body systems, and they have a similar demand that there's a pairwise collective decay of every particle that you can actually subscribe to, such that these atoms, they will end up becoming entangled by that, and then that entanglement will be spread all along the chain and, and give you a very interesting state. Just uh, actually a few days ago, there was a paper from uh, Michel Lukin's group uh, on the archive, you can find, look it up, where he shows how you can generate more or less general matrix product states. So there's a tool called matrix product states, and there's a mechanism that, that is analyzed in this paper on how you can use only dissipation again to actually form matrix product states of your quantum systems. The philosophy is pretty much laid out in those two papers, but here it's also analyzed in detail how it works and how fast it works. So it's, it's, it's a pretty nice uh, study of this particular work. Now, um, there has been experiments already with this, of course, so here's an experiment from the, from the uh, Rainer Blatt and, and Peter Soller teams where they take ions in an iron trap. And of course, they already have gate mechanisms in the iron trap. So they can easily entangle a pair of ions or they can easily entangle a group of ions. But in this particular work, they wanted to show that they can also do it using dissipation. So, so what you do is some clever scheme in which if a pair of ions are populating both a certain ground state, then there's a probability to be entangled to an unstable state and you will have spontaneous emission of photon. So this is the damping event that will happen every time it can. This damping event will occur, but eventually the ions will fall into a state where this stops happening. And when this stops happening, it's because you have ended up in an interesting entangled state for this uh, system here. And here they can do a, a kind of a quantum simulator where Although you actually wanted to do a unitary evolution for your quantum simulator, it's all practically done using dissipation instead. Uh, here's a paper with, with Dave Weinland's group together with Anna Sørensen, where, where, as you say, that Anna has done beautiful work actually on analyzing in general how this dissipative stuff works. And in this work, they just demonstrate how to make a, a maximally entangled state of two ions, also just by putting on lasers who are not driving the system into the entangled state, but who is punishing the ions if they're not there, by exciting them and letting them decay. And eventually the ions say, oh gosh, I don't like this, and then they fall into the state from which they don't get excited anymore. So it's a, it's a dark state for this particular laser atom interaction. So it has been done with superconducting qubits and analysis and also experimental work in Michel Devereux's group at Yale. And uh, it has also done a proposal, a very nice proposal, with NVE spins from the Jörg Wachtorf's group with, uh, with uh, Durga Dasai also, where it is shown how this kind of dissipation can be used to entangle an electron spin with a nuclear spin, not using the hyperfine interaction, but actually using the dissipation on the electron spin to push the electron and nuclear spins into this entangled state. Super nice and elegant proposal. Sharing all these features of being dark and being, having a destructive interference in the absorption process, which lets superposition states survive. And now these superposition states are designed to be the entangled states of that particular system. So I, de I decided to show you a single example that I know well because we worked on it with, with Dworkin, who I mentioned already, uh, just to, to show the, the inner workings of this uh, dissipation and how the dark state mechanism can, can come into play. So, so what I show you here is a system I've also shown before, a ground state, a middle excited state who is short-lived, and a high excited state who is long-lived. And this is a Rydberg state. This is um, some general excited state of an atom, and this is a hyperfine ground state. It also has another hyperfine ground state, and in fact, in the end, the entanglement will involve those two qubit levels down here. But the physics is really involving optical excitation on these transitions. So let's see if I can 
it explains slowly to you what's going on here. If I have this particular configuration with a single atom, there's uh, two dark states on that system. The state zero, who's completely uncoupled to anything, is of course a dark state, it's a ground state, it lives forever. And then there's the dark state I showed you before, a superposition of the one and the r, because they have destructive interference in the coupling to the middle state. So this system actually has two dark states. Uh, it could be a perfect qubit involving those two dark states. Of course, if I switch off the lasers, it's already a perfect qubit with the zero and the one states. So I'm not advertising this as being any smarter. But this is, this is two, two dark states of a single particle on this slide. Now, uh, we can plot these two levels as zero and D. That's nice. And these are the uh, states who can are steady states for the dynamics. They don't evolve uh, after at least the system has relaxed into one of those two states. Now, if I have two atoms, then of course I can prepare both atoms in the state zero and in the state D. So now I have four states, zero, 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 D, D, zero, and D, D. So I have two states for one, I have two states for the other one. Now, I'm a theoretical physicist. In fact, I was brought up with angular momentum theory. So if you give me two spins, I immediately couple the spins. Uh, but then we, before I do that, just say that I want to also add a Raman laser. So if I have a Raman transition between zero and one, it could also be a microwave drive here, then of course I just drive zero D and zero D transitions in those two, two atoms here. Now, the, the, the four states I just showed you can be rearranged into a singlet and a triplet manifold. So this is just the same basis, of course, but now I just pass on to the zero D minus D zero entangled state, and then the zero D plus D zero entangled state, zero, zero, and D, D. And this corresponds to spin zero total and spin one total if you do angular momentum. Now, the reason I pass to this basis is because the Raman drive who is rotating the spins don't do anything to a spin singlet because it's already rotationally symmetric. But among the spin triplet states, it's causing these transitions up and down and up and down, right? So if you, everything should work as normal, then your system may either populate that state or it may be bouncing around over here. Well, not exactly, because uh, we'll add now the last ingredient to the story. The DD state is a state in which you have a superposition of one and this R Rydberg state. That means that if I have two atoms DD, there's a small component where both atoms are in their Rydberg state. And if these atoms are not too far away from each other, they can actually feel each other because Rydberg states have very long range dipolar interactions. So we now assume that our atoms are, say, 10 micrometers apart, just enough that they can feel this Rydberg Rydberg interaction. Okay, such interactions we, we actually sometimes want to use for unitary quantum gates. The only thing I want to use them for here is to say that if there's any interaction between those two Rydberg states, this state has a small energy shift. It's not exactly sitting at the same distance to these other levels as it's plotted here. And that will actually cause a coupling from this state to other states in the system. So this is not the dark state anymore. The DD is not dark. It's going to cause some excitation. There's going to be some dephasing. And when you get wrong phases between 1 and R, you suddenly have coupling to the P state and spontaneous emission again. So, so what we predicted or what we expected would happen here is that this system would move into a manifold of these four states, but then on a much longer time scale, the population over here would be slowly re-excited back, and everything that returns to this state will stay there, and everything who returns to these three states will get a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, and will eventually end up in that single state over there. Okay, so that, I apologize for that. It was a little bit technical, but you can see we're using some interactions, but not perfect interactions. I'm not assuming this Rydberg interaction to be strong enough to give a good gate. I actually just assume it to be strong enough to disturb the system, to be a pain in a, a part of the atom. And, um, and it is. So, so uh, what is shown here, it's a little bit of a busy curve, but, but uh, let me just immediately flick here to, the, to what is shown here. This blue curve, or this blue curve for the long time trace, shows how much is the population of those four states. So very quickly, all excitation falls into that ground state, or these, these ground states, and then eventually on a longer time scale, you are depleting the three of them such that everything ends up finally in the this uh, red state here. So the red curve is actually the population of the state I really want, and you can see as time is progressing, it will eventually pick up the full population of that system. So this is a simulation of this uh, particular scheme. So what we see here is that, yeah, wait and wait, and then after some time you have that state. What is nice about it is I don't have to do anything. I just have to wait 25 microseconds. I don't even have time to get a coffee. And then I have that state in the lab permanently for the rest of the day. It's there when I need it. 
But that's what is sometimes advertised with these dates you get by dissipation, that in fact they are there when you need them. So you don't have to prepare them uh, exactly when you need them. They're just sitting there as a resource you can apply when, whenever you need an entangled state. So if you want to do quantum computing using this state for a teleportation step, it is already inside your machine. Uh, with Dwarga, we also moved on and said, what if we have a full cloud? Can we make some kind of entangled state of many atoms in the cloud by the same principle? And it turns out you can make a state called the W state. It's not the richest state in the world in terms of entanglement. It's actually a state in which everybody is in the ground state or there's a single excitation which is shared between all of them. Okay, so it's not a general entangled state of n particles. It's actually a, a system where you almost think of the whole cloud as a qubit because there are only two basis states occupied for this particular system. But it is an entangled state, and it's a state that, that we can make also using this uh, uh, dissipative uh, mechanism here. Now, uh, towards the end, I'd like to talk about another scheme, which is not really referring to dark states, but just another, another mechanism, or maybe another intuition that we can bring along when we want to do the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the entanglement of particles using dissipation. And that's referring to something called quantum xenodynamics. So the quantum xenodynamics and the quantum xeno effect is a story about measuring a system. And if a system occupies a certain state, uh, or actually measuring if a system is moving into an previously unoccupied state, you can prevent it from going there. Okay, so in quantum mechanics, I have a probability to be in some particular state, and if there's a state where the probability is zero, and I turn on a coupling, then I will start growing probability in that state, but if I measure and measure and measure, the probability that I will get no, 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 I'm not in that state, is high. And the more often I measure, the higher is that probability going to be, so eventually I can keep the particle from going into that state. And that's the quantum state. So uh, we can do that, and the funny thing is we can do it even without measurement, but uh, I'll come to that in a second. So here's an experiment from Florence uh, where they have the ground states of uh, rubidium atoms. So here they are all prepared in the state with f equal to 2. So here there are five different m sublevels. And you can prepare the system in this extreme state, and you can apply a magnetic field or RF field or Raman laser field to actually drive the population towards the other m states. But now they do something funny because they ask, are you in the two zero state? The way they ask is actually by exciting the two zero state into an excited state resonantly and then observe if there's decay, if there's fluorescence emission from this particular atom. And since you are asking, it has to say no, right, because of the Zeno mechanism. So instead of actually oscillating back and forth, you force the poor system to only go between those two states back and forth. So this is exactly what happens in the experiment if you don't probe, then you will see population over all five states. You will see five amplitudes going up and down. But if you probe very hard on this particular side here, then you will see only two states occupied. And that's these two extreme states, which are exactly doing this simple Rabi oscillation. And is, is this interesting? Yes. Of course it's interesting. It's a good paper. It's been published in Nature Communications. Yes, it's interesting because it's not always easy to make a state like that one. I mean, optical pumping will take you there, but this kind of dynamics between two states is an interesting kind of dynamics. But you can also think about it, this as leading elsewhere. You can also think about more complicated systems where you can restrict the dynamics simply by blocking the place where you don't want the system to go. And then you can think about this as a way to steer dynamics. It's not the Hamiltonian you're engineering. It's the damping you're engineering to block off parts of Hilbert space. And just think about it. What is an entangled state? Very often an entangled state is a state where you just block off the terms that would have turned it into a product state. So, so, so we can easily make entangled states if I can block off certain parts of your superposition. There's a, a whole literature of people fighting about xenodynamics. So every time these people give a talk, there will be new people in the room who haven't had this fight yet and have to say, it's not really the Zeno effect because you don't have to look. That's true. The magic of the Zeno effect is you don't even have to look since the probability is 100% that you won't see it. Of course, there's no reason to look <laughs> because that would be a waste of detection. So, so the fact that you just probe it that is coupled to your meter is enough to deface or broaden this level so much that you don't go there. And you can even also just shift it by an AC Stark shift, and then it looks more like Hamiltonian engineering. It's more the mindset that thinking about blocking a state is also a way to steer quantum dynamics. So we'll call that, and it's smart enough, it was called the quantum Zeno effect by the authors, uh, uh, or not, sorry, the quantum Zeno dynamics to oppose it from the quantum Zeno effect and try to avoid fights. It didn't work exactly. They're still fighting, of course. 
for the name. Well, in, in, this is a nice experiment from the Serge Ross team where they can block a particular angular momentum state such that when they drive a system along lots of different states in the hyper uh, Rydberg manifold, suddenly there's a state where you're not allowed to go, and therefore they do very funny uh, pictures of the angular momentum phase space. And here's an experiment by, by uh, Jakob Reichel's group in Paris where they make an entangled state of many particles. They can be all of them excited or any of them excited, but if none of them are excited, the cavity will transmit perfectly. So when they look through the cavity, then they will be able to distinguish that state from all the other states, and therefore the system is actually restricted to only populate these states, which also gives you crazy phase space pictures. Now, I, I hope I have uh, just five minutes to tell you the story about our quantum Zeno training that we did with Durga, because this is, I think, a new concept. It's a little bit funny. Um, I will introduce it by, by reminding you of, uh, of Sotomayor, Cuban uh, athlete who had the, or still has the world record in high jump, 2 meters 45, back from 1995. So it didn't work the way that he one day, never tried it before, went into the field, and then he jumped 2 meters and 45. Of course, he trained his whole life. Um, so through training, and also during the tournaments, even you know how it goes on, you progressively accomplish higher and higher achievements. So you start, and then you can jump uh, 1 meter and 80, and 1 meter and 90, 2 meters, and then you can jump higher and higher. So each move you do here, when you do such a jump, is actually a big and discrete thing. But the advancement from the previous jump you made is maybe adiabatic. So you're only gradually becoming a better and better high jumper, but actually doing the jump itself is not something continuous. So this has nothing directly with the Zeno effect to do because with the Zeno effect, I'm actually preventing sort of adiabatic, slow population feeding into the state. But I, I, I will try to, to describe uh, this proposal as, as if we are training a quantum system to be able to make bigger and bigger jumps. So, so the idea we have is that we have a bunch of atoms uh, on a line or in a grid, and I want to make a global entangled state, and the only thing I have is a nearest neighbor pretty lousy interaction between the atoms, like the Rydberg, Rydberg one I showed you before. And what we want to do is we want to start all qubits in the zero state, and then I want to apply the same small angle rotation to them. A small angle rotation that puts a little bit of amplitude for all of them into the one state, but keeps most of it in the zero state. And then I will kill all components of the state where there's a nearest near neighbor one one pair. Okay, so if I've rotated them all just a little bit, there will be a small probability that any pair nearest neighbor has both atoms in the one state, and I want to kill that out of the superposition state. Now, I can do that using this Rydberg blockade I just showed you before, and then I just rotate them again, but next time with a slightly small, larger angle, and a slightly larger angle, and a slightly larger angle. And then we just see what is going to happen. So, I mean, eventually, I will have an increasing amount of rotation that I apply to the qubits, every time killing if there is a nearest neighbor one one pair. Let me show you what it looks like in, 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 in a figure. But I mean, what, what will happen, I, I just tell you that immediately, is that I'm actually going to get into a state where every second bit is going to be in the zero state, and every one in the one state, but in superposition. So it's actually an entangled state. So, so uh, here's a picture of what's going on. Here's a block sphere, and here is this small angle rotation around this purple axis. So if I start with everybody at zero, I put everybody into this one state, but then this will actually correspond to a little conflict because there will be some amplitude that some of these atoms will both be in the one state. So when I kill that particular component, I will now have a, a rather complicated quantum state. But I just move on, make the angle larger and larger. So later, I'm going to make this rotation to the state. And you can see that, roughly speaking, if I rotate this purple axis a little bit, then the blue part will be rotated back towards the red. The red will be moved towards the blue. So nothing much is changing. But because I make the angle larger and larger all the time, I will end up having these two blobs on the block sphere being rotated into each other. And if I can do that, then eventually I will have a superposition where every second atom is here, the other second atom is, is there, that state, and vice versa. And every time I apply this rotation, I just keep the same state because I'm just rotating one half of the wave function into the other half of the wave function. And this is exactly what is happening. So the state we get, with using this, uh, this crazy mechanism is actually a state, okay, here's the damping mechanism that I already showed you, um, is a state where you start with everybody at zero, and then after I rotate this purple axis, so now I'm really rotating around this pi or two axis, then I have a state which is zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, no conflict, plus one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, also a state with no conflict in it. 
And you can also see what is happening, because if I take the purple axis to be now completely horizontal, then the blue dot has become the south pole. And the rotation around the axis is exactly the one who turns 0 into 1, 1 into 0, 0 into 1, 1 into 0. And that's exactly what you sit is sitting over here in the second part. So we have trained our system to do a pi rotation, but being in a superposition state, so it's invariant under that pi rotation. So we have simulated that, but we haven't had the time to write down the paper, but at least now it's on camera. So, so, so it's a, a, a scheme where we again use the dissipation, because the Hamiltonian alone would have been really boring. The only thing I do on the qubits with my Hamiltonian is rotating, 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 rotating. And rotations on qubits will just give me a big product state where all the spins would point in some new direction in the end. But because of this tiny effect of dissipation, which did not even happen, because it was the Zeno mechanism, so you know, there was no, no jumps even. There was no detection of these events. The probability was constantly suppressed at every step. But because it was there, we can go into this particular state. So it's almost magic, but that's the effect of, of this uh, Zeno dynamics. So that brought me to the end. Uh, I went through a few pictures of, uh, and, and ideas for how we can actually use this dissipation to create funny states. So in summary or conclusion, dissipation is something that transforms quantum states in ways which are quite complementary to unitary evolution. Very often we read in the textbooks it's incoherent and it does bad things, but in fact you can tame it to do good things for you. The state preparation, the memory protection, error correction, gate operations, metrology, and all these things relate to, to these dissipative mechanisms and can be done using dissipation. The dissipation strength and the character may be optimized. So I mean, maybe you want to do a particular experiment. And we know there's a lot of experts in optimal control theory steering Hamiltonians. Now, this could be another quantity you should actually steer to do optimal control on dissipative state preparation. The intuition, think jump, no jump, think dark states. Is there a dark state in this system that you can actually make the final state you want? Uh, but think also Zeno mechanism, suppress the unwanted dynamics or, or train your system if you like. And then since it's dissipation, we can all sit back together with the system and relax when the physics is taking place. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>